power's off because it's gone out the whole town. Yeah, the whole town's lost its power, and therefore uh, there's, there's, there's a different uh, electrical effect in the room currently. Oh. We think. So we'd like you to go in and experience, well, not so much experience. A get demon? A, get out the feel of the room now, and when the power's on again later, to see if you think that room feels different later on with the electrical energy running through it, basically. The demon room, all right. Okay, well, let's go. White Heart Hotel. Ghosts, possessions, demons. demons. Monks, little girls with candles. I hear there's even a Jack the Ripper connection. Yeah, there's also a pedophile that possesses you. You sure you want to go in? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Possession by pedophile? Yeah. Just once, couldn't we get possession by Playboy Bunny? You want to be a female with really big boobs? Ah, to dream. Awkward. You said it. Well, this is supposed to be the room. Dining room. Uh, the dining room. Shall I knock a shoe? Let's knock together. Hello. This is Sadler's husband. Dave Sadler. Good evening, sir. Good evening, man. Hi. Dave. See you again. Hello, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care. The White Hart Hotel in Itoxer, England, is an historic property with myriad ghost stories associated with it. Holly and I were lucky to be working with our very good friends from the Unknown Phenomena Investigation Association. As they began their preparations for the evening with their usual thoroughness, she and I went downstairs to chat with Graham Ferguson, the manager of the hotel, about some of the more interesting paranormal stories associated with the property. I've had experiences here at the White Hart um, ever since I've been here. I sit behind reception and out the corner of your eye you just see what looks like a child running up the stairs and you go to him where are you going? You're not meant to be up there and realise there's absolutely nothing there. He's also got a distinct smell to him, a Play-Doh smell. So if he's around and he's playing, he can smell Play-Doh. No one can ever explain why we get that smell. Upstairs in the area that's known as the torture chamber, there's been reported sightings of blood on the shower curtain. So you go up and you check the room and there's not anything else anywhere on the shower curtain, nothing that you could say. Oh, Perhaps that's what they thought is blood. They're totally clean. You go back down to the guest guy. Are you sure you've seen blood on the shower curtain? He says, yeah, yeah, it's all over it. So you take the guest back up and say, can you show me where? There's nothing on them. Along with many areas of the hotel that had reports of ghosts, there was also a room that had alleged manifestations of what Graham ominously referred to as demonic activity. Through the uh, investigations we've done in the past, it turns out there's a lady there that was forced to have an abortion that didn't like didn't want to have an abortion because she got pregnant out of wedlock and didn't believe in leaving them. And she's meant to target ladies that have had, you know, personal issues in the past. The White Hart Hotel was clearly a location with a lot of reported paranormal activity. As we were discussing with the UPIA where to start the investigation, the power in the entire town went out. This gave us the perfect opportunity to start in the so-called demonic room because if anything weird did happen here, it wouldn't be because of electromagnetic fluctuations. This is the room that the, uh, the demon is supposedly Yeah, in. yeah, apparently it's been reported that demonic activity takes place in that. And the power's off because it's gone out the whole town. Yeah, the whole town's lost its power, and therefore uh, there's, there's a different uh, electrical effect in the room currently, oh. we think. So we'd like you to go in and experience, well, not so much experience, a get, demon? A, get out the feel of the room now, and when the power's on again later, to see if you think that room feels different later on with the electrical energy running through it, basically. The demon room, all right. Okay, well, let's go. This one. Yeah. Yeah, that would be the one. Oh, 
Demon haunted. How do you feel? Where's the hot spot supposed to be? Where's the place you're supposed to stand? Do you have any like anything? this room. I mean, it's a gorgeous room, but I was standing right here. I didn't tell them this. And uh, I was just like, there's something wrong with this space. It's just bleh. That, I did, my head did that. Anyway, the whole bed itself actually is surrounded by uh, bad levels of EMF. But with the power off right now, you're going to lie on it. That's fantastic. With the power off, they're not detecting any of the EMF in this, in this room that they were getting before. Now, it feels different. It doesn't feel as strange, but this room still hurts my head. It's weird. Even though the EMF levels have dropped. So what did you feel? It's... Awkward. I don't feel anything. It's just real. No. Hello, demons. Any demons? I was pretty sure that there were no demons in the demon room, at least not while we were there. So we decided to move to another room where there had been reports of paranormal activity and where Steve and Dave from the UPIA had set up a little experiment with their EMF meters. Right, uh, Paul and Holly, basically we've got a unique opportunity, uh, one that we probably never have before and it's unlikely we'll ever have again to investigate certain parts of the building for certain things in particular today. Uh, the town has had a, a power cut, so, mm. so pff, amazingly, brilliantly, and it's given us the opportunity to do a sensor sweep um, with the MF equipment uh, in relation to sensor sweeps that we've done previously. Uh, and and this, is, this is, as I say, a fantastic opportunity because we can, we've mapped certain locations of EMF hotspots and we're able to now look into them hotspots and see if they still occur and now the power's off. And the power's off, it's not even, it looks dark in here, but it's actually still daylight out there. It's daylight on all the shops and premises locally within a, quite a, a wide area. Of, there's been a, a substation gone down and all the power's gone locally. All right, well, let's take advantage of this opportunity. Let's start with the bed. Okay, baby. Let's see how that's... <laughs> Why? 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 With the power in the town off, we had a rare opportunity to run some controlled comparative tests in the torture room to see if perhaps the EMF levels were responsible for the paranormal activity occurring there. Currently we've got a high EMF, as you can hear, the gout meter is uh, registering uh, four on the scale. Sounds like Daleks. If I try and give it a bit of a rub, etc, etc, it should. That's my hand that I've just discharged with. Yeah. <laughs> go higher. Does that go higher? Or should it be going lower? Now, what we're talking is that the actual EMF when we first came in here was off the scale. It couldn't even be read on that meter. Just from the frame? Or just from the frame. I think Phil can verify that. That was off the scale, wasn't it? Yeah. That so was after the power was that on. That was after the power. No, the power was on. Oh, okay. particular time. So you can see the difference between current EMF which has been induced at the time we're doing the test mm. and the difference now if we're actually looking at what we've got now is very low, very low uh, EMF. So we can say really that a lot of it is down to the electrical wiring in place. So we're actually picking, we were actually, we were actually spiking above 10 milligauss originally. We're down to 4 milligauss when the power's come off and when we've discharged we're down to about 2. Is it still continuing to decrease? Yeah, it'll decrease over a period of time. Um, it, it would If the power stayed off in two hours and we come back and, and measured it, it should, should be more or less zero. Over a period of time, through the duration of the night, we're slowly soaking in EMF. High amounts of EMF as well. And over a period of just, say, three hours, at 10 milligauss, you know, you're going to start feeling the effects. You're going to start feeling sort of anxious. Um, you might start to think that it's a bit strange and getting a bit of a strange feeling in here. Ghost Cases returns. Our investigation of the White Hart Hotel in Utoxeter, England gets bloody weird. It's dry.
continue our investigation, strange things start to happen in the White Hart Hotel. Well, more than likely, uh, EMF affects the physiology. Electromagnetic frequencies affect the physiology. Hmm. They're known scientifically to cause different things occur to a person. Um, Hallucinations. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So what we'd probably say in this instance is that somebody who stays in this bed for a period of time would therefore have some form of EMF effect, some form of effect in relation to the EMF that they're that they're within. So, for instance, if you sleep in here tonight, it's more than likely that you'll start having bad dreams, you'll start thrashing about, you'll be up in a mood, headache, etc., etc. Mm. And it's all basically down to, more or less, a uh, an allergy to electricity. Right. But because the power is off here now, yeah. the reason you're doing this, um, what, what makes this a unique opportunity? Right, this is a unique opportunity. Because there's no EMF, because there's no power, we can, we can monitor the room in a na more or less a natural environment, we took away the the EMF, the the unnatural, mm. and we can we can now monitor it naturally. So later on, if we come back again later on, when the power's back on in the building, mm. you should see a high increase in the. This should be off the scale and in in effect. Right. Which which then again would would suggest to me, people would experience more activity, maybe paranormal activity. <laughs> We took some final EMF readings in the torch room and found that they were the same as the ones we'd previously recorded. Yeah, it's a bit too sensitive for the problem at the side, so if you just drop it off. I then headed down to the demon room to check on the trigger items that the UPIA had set up to see if perhaps something paranormal had interacted with them. Our client is believing that there's demonic activity in this room. We've left a Bible on the bed. Um, basically because I, I believe that if we did have a demon in this room, that this would cause some kind of effect. Happiness. One would think. Happiness. One would think, and, and because Steve's missing a crucifix, which is what we would usually use. Um, so we've just left that there, and nothing's happened to it, obviously. As on a previous visit, when we left the crucifix on the bed, nothing happened to that either. I would have thought if there were a demon in here, that uh, by now we would have got a bit fed up. Reacted to it somehow. Yeah. Instead, I, I guess all we're finding is the same EMF reading. We're just finding the EMF, which is producing the symptoms that Graham's claiming are caused by the demon. Interesting. After we had finished our uneventful sweep with the EMF meters and our check of the trigger items in the so-called demon room, we got a call from Dave Sadler to come down to the kitchen where something interesting had happened. Okay, this is the upstairs uh, kitchen. Uh, the alleged apparition of a young child has been witnessed um, in, in this area. And we set up a, a number of trigger objects to try and coax if, if possible, if it's um, a manifestation that can uh, do things physically to coax the child to, uh, to move things. We've got a blackboard with chalk, we've got a magnetic board with numbers, letters and such like on. And we've also got uh, a little jigsaw type thing where they put the, uh, the bits of things in and out and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to Steve Mira now in regards to the event that's just taken, we've just found may have taken place. Um, I came down to the location about 10 minutes ago and noted that earlier on I actually placed the letters A, B, C on the line on this magnetic board. And when I actually came back to the location, the letter B was off and slightly down at an angle, which I noted that um, I, nobody had been in this area because we've been quite strictly controlling it. We've had red tape uh, across the doorway to restrict people from coming in. And the, the location was left in the dark as well. And about five minutes ago, we came in here in the dark. We switched on the lights. We came in. We noticed that uh, it was obviously at an angle. So what we've done now is we've set up uh, our own video camera, which has infrared. And we're going to be filming in the dark. We're going to exactly the same conditions as to when the phenomena took place. So we're going to leave the, this particular area in the same conditions, such as no lights on. We put the letter back to where it currently was at the beginning of the night. Uh, and basically we're going to leave this area, lock it off again to see if we can get, uh, get it to happen again. As Steve and Dave sealed off the kitchen again, I got a report from one of the UPIA investigators, Phil Bordley. Apparently he had experienced something very similar to one of the paranormal stories that Graham had told us. As I walked in, I got, I got hit by a blast of the smell of Play-Doh. 
which is associated here with the ghost of a child which we've nicknamed Thomas. He's quite often seen, the sm he's quite often smelt. Uh, I'm a disbeliever in, I'm, I'm a skeptic when it comes to ghosts, but I've smelt it now on two different occasions here in unexplained circumstances. Upstairs, I got hit by a major blast of it. My eyes were sore and my nose was streaming and I felt nauseous with the smell of it. Uh, but it went almost immediately. It was at this point that things started to get very weird very quickly. A call came in on the radio that a substance that appeared to be blood had been found on the shower curtain in room 18. The shower curtain there has got red splatters on, which you didn't have before. Incident as in, can we get in here, go look? Yeah. Yeah, you see the splatters. One of the things we posted in here was blood on the shower curtain. Yeah. Yeah. There's been at least uh, at least half a dozen people in here who haven't seen that, including me, the time of the last. I was in here at 10.15. It's not the extractor fan because the extractor and fan is extracting rather than bringing it in. Fan. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just looking at the pattern actually. Yeah. It's it's in it's in. It's come from latitude. It's almost as if it's been like yeah. that. It's yeah. got a downward angle. As yeah. Well, so and so of the others and across yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's something. And I say like I, tr that. I tried a bit of water from the top spot up there. It's water soluble. Yeah. You see, if, it, if it's a blood splatter from some, well, allegedly somebody being stabbed or whatever, you don't get that kind of splatter. No. That's that's been that's been very direct. I'm just gonna I'm gonna touch this for a second. I just want to see you guys to see that I'm doing that. It's dry. Yeah. But it's you can see it's been wet because the capillary action there, it's well, whatever th that main spot there has travelled through, has travelled through the fibres. My initial thought was, it's too profound to have just happened at that time. But then, nevertheless, you know, I, I, we have to actually look at that and disprove the fact that it is blood. At this stage, it's far too early to actually say it is, to conclude it is. Our pre-conclusion is, is that it's, it's some type of um, liquid which is, which is dried on, on the top of the shower curtain. But at this stage, our, our pre-conclusive stage, we say that it, it could be something unusual, uh, and if it does turn out to be blood, then um, we really haven't got an explanation um, for it at this time. Finding what appeared to be blood on the shower curtain in room 18 had everyone in the investigative team pretty excited, but the UPIA handled it like professionals. They sealed off the area and treated it like a crime scene where they took photos and samples. However, when Graham was informed of what we'd found, he was pretty shocked and more than a little shaken. Guys up uh, upstairs were shouting up and down the stairs, going, there's blood on the shower curtain, blood on the shower curtain. And I thought they were pulling me chains, so I went up to have a look for myself. And I walked into the room and I felt it was sick to my stomach and saw all splattered across the top of the shower curtain, blood, or what looks like blood. I had to get out of that room. It was the weirdest feeling I've ever felt in that room. And I've never, ever seen the blood there. And I'll tell you what, I don't want to see it again. When they ask to take the shower curtain, they can take the shower curtain and not bring it back. When Ghost Cases returns, Holly and I try to make contact with the spirit of a little girl in the cellar of the White Hart Hotel. I've been up to the bloody room. I can't imagine anything that would get weirder than that. As our investigation continues, Holly and I try to make contact with the spirit of a little girl in the cellar of the White Hart Hotel. Graham seemed genuinely disturbed by the blood that was found on the shower curtain. We sat down to chat, and at this point he told me that the cellar of the hotel was also haunted, this time by the ghost of a little girl from the late 19th century who had been seen by a number of people. He and I headed downstairs to see if we could make contact with the little girl's spirit, but just as we were about to begin, Paul wandered in. Okay, so we've got our tattoo. Oh, Ow. Nice. Paul? Do no, you, do you have a teddy bear? I do. I thought I'd come down and join you guys. Okay, well, we're just about to get started here. We're trying to recreate a scenario that happened uh, with Graham when he was down here before with objects being thrown at him. and. Uh, That's why I brought the teddy bear, isn't it? 
Uh, I was up with the UPIA guys, but one of them told me that it was a, uh, a kid that's down here, right? Yep. There's, there's stories of a kid being down here. When we did our call out here in the ghost hunt, we had a kid from down the bottom end with was seen with a gas light and a teddy bear, a young girl with like Victorian night dress sort of thing on her. I mean, she was from just down there. Um, whilst we were also down here, something got thrown at us from the other end of the cellar as well. Mm, okay. And he personally saw this? I was personally here and uh, scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, so now we're trying to do it again. <laughs> Cheers, guys. We really appreciate that. Um, as I was just saying, we've got, our, we've got our temperature. What's it reading right now? 18 degrees Celsius. 18 degrees Celsius. Um, we've got an ADR here set up that's recording. And can you walk us through what we do here? Yeah, um, in our deal world, we would want to be uh, sitting down there holding hands. Oh. Teddy bear can join in too. <laughs> it's very sweet. <laughs> so where do no, we I want to put the him on the floor. Where do we put the teddy bear? You can Probably just from sit, side. sit back there. So maybe he'll move. Oh. I like that. <laughs> and then I'm afraid of intimacy, so. <laughs> and, then if, and then if we take it in turns. Hey, 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 hey. You guys gotta hold hands. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is great. And if we take in turns to either ask for if there's any spirit people down there to bang something, move something, uh, touch one of us, who knows, it might happen again for us if we're really lucky. All right, so I, okay, so do we have to close our eyes? You don't have to close your eyes, just okay. do it. Just shout it out loud. Wow, the last time I heard that. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> Holly. All right. So, if there is uh, if there is a, a spirit down here, if there is some sort of uh, unknown paranormal entity that would like to communicate with us, we would be willing to accept your communication at this point in time. So, feel free to reach out and touch one of us. Feel free to, to talk to us, either uh, directly or you can speak through the ADR, which we'll listen to later. Feel free to make a noise, knock on something, bang on something. Throw something at Paul. What she said, except for the throwing something at Paul part, let's throw something at Holly. That was that was good. That was clever and original. Do something for me. I'd love to do it again for us. Just to show that it happened first time for me. How many people were down here with you? There was a group of about 10 of us last time, but we were all holding hands again. Right. Like we are now. Touch one of us. Touch one of the cameraman. Bang a beer barrel. Do anything for us just to show us you're here. Feel free to interact with the other one. Bring it on. You might regret saying that. I've been up to the bloody room, I just can't imagine anything that would get weirder than that. I'm gonna go check on the progress of the other U of the UPIA guys. Okay. You guys were the ones originally down here. Maybe you're obviously, you've seen it, you mm -hmm. believe it, and you've always struck me as slightly more open-minded than I am. I keep reminding you that. Yeah. Um, so I'll leave you two guys here, and maybe without my sort of dark, forbidding, skeptical presence, if there is something, give it another 10 minutes, see what happens. Graham and I spent about another half hour in the cellar, but nothing seemed to happen. So we headed upstairs to rejoin Paul and the UPIA, who'd begun packing up. It wasn't until later that we discovered my audio recorder had picked up an eerie, childlike voice as I was leaving the basement. And we're back upstairs now. And we're back upstairs now. There's no question that strange things happened at the White Hart Hotel that neither Holly nor I, nor our friends in the UPIA, could explain. It could have been a hoax, or it could have been a combination of coincidences and environmental stimuli. Or it's just possible that the White Hart Hotel really is haunted, in which case it would make for a very interesting place to spend a night, as long as you don't mind sharing a room with a demon. And we're back upstairs now.